Welcome to the webinar series 2024. Good afternoon. My name is Daniela Much. I am the scientific lead at Medela Europe within our medical affairs team. And we are really pleased to welcome you to the second Denver webinar of this year's series, which we are really delighted to support. So thank you for being here. A few words about Medela. Medela was founded by a Swedish entrepreneur called Ole Larsson, really inspired by his own family experience and in particular his uh, wife's experience as a young and new mom, breastfeeding has always been a core focus. So Ole Larsson's mission was really to advance research in the field of human lactation, observe simple behaviors of mothers and their infants, and develop intuitive care with appropriate products, with the aim to ultimately turn science into care. And a critical pillar to support breastfeeding for all infants, and particular for small, sick and preterm babies, is the access to human milk and high intakes of human milk. So with this webinar today, we really would like to support you in having more human milk in your neonatal units and discuss the how to, how to achieve this goal. So before I hand over to our current EMBA president, Professor Sertash Aslanoglu, I would like to briefly mention a few housekeeping rules. So you are um, kindly asked um, to please uh, come with your questions anytime during the course of this webinar. Um, to submit your questions, please use the question and answer box in your control panel on the right-hand side. Professor Aslanoglu will then take your questions during the discussion session at the end of the webinars. So the speakers will then try to answer as many questions as possible. Organizational questions can of course be asked anytime and we will of course support you in the background if you encounter any technical issues. Your certificate of attendance will be available in the download section at the end of the webinar. And um, also a short survey will appear at the end of today's webinar so that we can get your valuable feedback. And uh, please take a second and let us know if you have enjoyed this webinar today. So with this, I wish you a very interesting and inspiring session. And now I'll hand over to Professor Sertas Aslanoglu. Good afternoon, dear audience and uh, dear speakers. I'm pleased today to uh, moderate the second edition of the uh, webinar series organized by European Milk Bank Association uh, and supported by Medela. I thank them uh, for their support. So uh, our topic today is more human milk in the neonatal unit. Yes, but how? Oh. Uh, we have two distinguished speakers today uh, that will give answers to our questions. And uh, uh, brief information, we all know that the human milk feeding uh, is the gold standard, but it is vital for preterm infants. It, uh, human milk confers uh, a protection against necrotizing enterocolitis and uh, most of the against most of the uh, challenges in, in ICU, so it is very important to protect, to promote, and to support breastfeeding. Our uh, optimal goal is to reach exclusive breastfeeding, and uh, but how? This is the topic of this. Uh, webinar. So in European uh, neonatal intensive care units, uh, there are um, initiatives, supportive uh, implementation, uh, so that uh, this goal could be approached. And uh, today you will have, uh, I am sure, uh, your answers to this how question. 
Uh, let me uh, introduce you our first uh, speaker. Uh, he is Professor Zwen Velman. Uh, he is trained in pediatrics and neonatal medicine. He worked at the university hospitals in Berlin, uh, Basel and Zurich in Switzerland. He established recently uh, a donor milk bank at his hospital in Regensburg and initiated a quality improvement initiative for specialized breastfeeding and lactation support in late preterm infants, an important uh, topic. His research focus is on the first 1,000 days of life with main research areas in fetal and neonatal stress response and neuroprotection. He is the founding director of the European School of Neonatology. So, uh, so please join me inviting to the virtual stage, uh, Professor Zvan uh, Wellman. His topic is lactation and breastfeeding in late preterm infants. Thank you so much, Seta, for this very kind introduction. And hello, everyone, wherever you are. It's my great pleasure being given the opportunity to talk to you on a topic which is really very close to our hearts. I thank the European Bank, um, Milk Bank Association very much, and of course Medela for giving me the opportunity to talk to you and present this topic, lactation and breastfeeding in late preterm infants, a quality improvement initiative. Well, please the next slide. I will give you some background information on this, we can also say neglected population. So because these late preterms are just late preterms, but I will share with you some data that we really have to focus on this population and then share with you the data you already know what are the evidence-based measures for increased lactation. And then we'll show you the data of our study we performed in the past two years here in my, my unit, in my neonatal unit in the whole hospital, uh, including all staff members, so from the midwives up to, to all the doctors. And we'll come finally, of course, to some conclusions. The next slide, please. So you may know that out, so out of 10, one baby, so 10% of all babies are born preterm. And that means below 37 weeks of gestation. And of these preterm babies, 80 to 90% are born between 32 and 36 weeks. So that means more than three weeks before the due date. And within this range, of 32 to 36 weeks. Here you see my um, the data of my unit. Um, we have with all the deliveries, that's the bottom line, 3,500, 3,200 last year. And you see that we pretty good uh, see fulfill here um, the, this um, amount of about 10% um, preterm infants in the range 32 to 36 weeks. The next one. Well, so what is now about the relevance of being born, let's say, just six weeks, that means 34 weeks before the due date? The body weight and the brain volume, so the brain weight together, is 40% lower, lower compared to a um, baby born at 40 weeks of gestation. And you know that the maturation of the body is incomplete. All the functioning, all the processes are not really ready to go. So, and especially when having, having a closer look, what are the morbidities? It is hypoglycemia. There's a high risk for these 34 weeks for these late preterms getting born with um, problems in the sugar um, processing. They have drinking, feeding difficulties. 
many have some mild, most of them not severe, but many have some mild respiratory morbidities. I will come to this in more detail next. And there is jaundice, of course, and the body temperature instability. And you see on this normal gram with the weight that with 34 weeks born, the expected weight is about 2.1 or 2.2 kilogram. This could be just enough to keep the temperature, maybe in summertime more than the winter time, but uh, many of them need some special neonatal care. So the next slide, please. We put here together data, not published yet, but these data are in press, as you see, from a prospective study we did in, in my time in, in Switzerland from 2009 to 2016, where we just recorded prospectively um, respiratory mobility in infants born from 34 weeks up to 40 weeks. And you see that when they are at term date, so 40 weeks, 39 weeks, so it's given on the axis you see down the gestation age in days, there is a very low, um, a very low morbidity for um, RDS, for any respiratory morbidity. But when you go earlier to go to uh, 37, 36, then it increases. And what also increases is the difference between those born by vaginal delivery, so spontaneous or with some support if needed, and those um, delivered with non-emergency C-section. So we've not included the few numbers of really emergency section, but all the others are included. And you see that there is a significant difference that below 38 weeks, those delivered by cesarean section are really at much higher risk to have any kind of respiratory morbidity. This is not severe respiratory morbidity, not intubation ventilation, of course, in the main cases not, but just having some tachypnea, needing a little bit of oxygen, maybe some CPAP therapy for a couple of hours or days. And at 34 weeks, half of all the deliveries, half of all the babies, have any kind of at least mild respiratory morbidity. Therefore, this is not a population we can ignore. We really have to focus on that. And I will tell you why um, there is really a need to have a closer focus on this population. The next slide, please. Well, this is again to demonstrate why there are these respiratory morbidities. And this is the reason that the lung is full of lung liquid uh, in utero. And at the time point of delivery, the lung must get rid of this liquid. The liquid must go out and getting reabsorbed. And when this process is complicated or happens too early, like in late, in moderate, or even extremely preterms, the liquid is not get, getting properly and within seconds or minutes out, and then we have the so-called wet lung or the transintactic of the newborn. And this is the main reason. It's not the surfactant deficiency in the, in the late preterms. It's the wet lung causing transfer to a neonatal unit. Next slide, please. Well, the question now is, um, do moderate to late preterm infants develop well? Are there any consequences possible? when coming to, to a later age to school at the end, the next one. And I would like to share with you a very nice study performed by the colleagues in Ireland, um, Geraldine Boiling as a group leader. They started over a certain time period, term bonds and mild moderate to, to late preterms. And I circled for you the most important information that on average there is 6% difference. So they have a delay in the general neurological development. And they looked only on the healthy, late, moderate and late preterm. So they excluded those with persistent hypoglycemia or other reasons for a neurodevelopmental delay. And the end point was at two years, but as you know, 
there is of course some plasticity and there are opportunities for for the kids to to improve during time until school but at this is a significant um, difference seen at two years, and I think it's important. Next slide, please. And there is a similar effect uh, regarding cardiometabolic risk. So what you probably know when uh, that these preterms not getting um, a very adipositors or they, they do not develop a, such a feature, but they have a risk to have higher systolic blood pressure, they have problems with their metabolism, and all this together demonstrates that they have a significant increased risk for um, later life uh, problems in this field. Next slide, please. Well, so putting this together, we see that there's this huge um, difference in when you look at a 34 weeker compared to a 40 weeker in um, body weight and brain volume. Maturation is not complete. Most of the 34 weekers require special neonatal care, at least for a couple of days, some need two or three weeks, and they are at increased risk for neurologic and cardiometabolic problems in later life. The next one, please. So coming to the to the key question, well, we all want to have more human milk in the neonatal unit. Well, we fully agree on this, but how? For me, in my new region in Bavaria, um, when I moved from Switzerland there, it was pretty clear we need our own human donor milk bank to have for our own preterms and also for the surrounding uh, perinatal centers, human milk uh, available. And it was also clear that when establishing um, such a human milk bank, it's not sufficient to have this technically running. We need um, really a big change in, in the attitude bringing the breast milk in the middle of, of um, our understanding and really making clear and making sure that breastfeeding is supported as much as possible because we need of, at the end uh, the donating mothers. And in, uh, in the context of how to study this when we open um, such a milk bank, which is the population we can um, investigate and where might be uh, the, the highest um, relevance to study. And of course, the extremely preterms you already heard in the introduction with necrotizing enterocolitis and other uh, risks, they are key to us. But the largest populations are the late preterms. So we decided we do a research trial on moderate and late preterm infants and study how they may profit, so this was our hypothesis, from this introduction of a donor milk bank and all the efforts around uh, information on breastfeeding. The next one. Well, it starts um, with your local breastfeeding rate. I was not sure what our breastfeeding rate is. Well, we do have this uh, data from a uh, wide recent publication from Germany, and I assume that it is similar in your areas, that at delivery there's high motivation of the, of the mothers to, to breastfeed. And they, at least in our unit, I do see in our hospital that they majority, 87%, that is pretty fine with what we see here, would like to initiate, get it initiated. but when you look at the first days and weeks, the number drops and at four months, so this is somehow the minimum, it's recommended to do exclusive breastfeeding from the WHO for six months. But with four months, I think that's um, a time frame quite important to cover, cover with breastfeeding. There are only 40% and with six months, 30%. And these are all newborns. These are not the late preterms, not the, the, the very preterms. It is a whole population. 
So not very encouraging for me right now. And this was somehow where we started the next one. We know pretty well what to do to increase breastfeeding in preterm infants. This is a systematic um, review, putting together trials performed in the past. You see them all listed here, and you see the, the forest plot um, indicating that once you do what everyone knows more or less, then you can really increase the breastfeeding rate until discharge home. So these studies all investigated the success until discharge home. Next one. And what are these measures to do? It's education of the hospital staff in all the studies, 16 out of 16, they did it. Parental education is very important. And then it comes down um, availability of pumps, of course, when they do not can really breastfeed the babies, the mother need pumps to, to get the uh, lactation initiated and get the milk. And all these elements are really uh, in, the, in these 16 studies investigated and proven to be successful. Next one. Well, so coming back to my hospital and the question, how can we implement a uniformed information platform that the parents, the midwives, the nurses, the doctors, everyone has the same information. I was wondering whether I have to, to invest hours and many, many weeks to, to bring this all in a place and was very happy to realize that this is not needed because a colleague from the university in Cologne, together with a broad funding from our government, in, um, really in, investigated very much time, so spent it very much time to set up a platform, an application, where all the information is available and tailored for parents, for, for professionals, for everyone interested there in different languages. So you see just one information sheet here for on hygiene uh, in English, in French, and in, in other languages available. So this was really key to me to realize, wow, everything is already available. We do not have to invent the real uh, you. Next one. And here, just as an overview, you see there are many, many details, there are videos, there's a lot of information. Next one, please. So our study we performed in my hospital was a prospective one, an intervention study. We analyzed the data, how it's running so far before. Then we did the implementation of the new information package with all the trainings based on the new milk app. And then afterwards we measured again, we included mothers uh, 18 years or older, only moderate or late preterms with a wish to breastfeed at birth. Language, la uh, German language was um, needed because not all uh, language at this time, so just two, three years ago, were already available. And um, the primary outcome we designed would be at four months of age, so not at discharge home, breast milk feeding at four months of age. So there's a regular visit at the outpatient children doctors. And at that time with four months of age, we uh, checked all the parameters interested last time. And we performed the pre-intervention study in uh, summer 2022. Then in fall, we um, set up the milk bank and opened the milk bank and last year in summer, June to October, we did the post intervention. Next slide, please. Well, this is how the information we use from the new milk app we put together in the leaflets with QR codes so that, that everyone or the parents had access. Next one. And this was in my experience very important 
that everyone working there, these are just a few examples how with posters and leaflets, everything is equipped when you go to the hospital, starting in the, in the, uh, where the maternity is and everywhere we have the posters and a uniform really layout. And this was key to use this information package in the layout of our hospital. Next one. Well, a couple of parameters we measured and I shall have here put together some of the study components. So enrollment within the first three days after the delivery. We checked on a daily basis the milk production within the first three weeks. We um, documented the route of feeding, whether tube or bottle breast or a combination of all this. Also, when they were on the, on the intravenous line time point of first bonding within minutes after delivery or half an hour, one hour, then the frequency of kangaroo mother care, which is of course very supportive for breastfeeding, the frequency of lactation support the parents asked for. We also looked what are the families coming from, so socioeconomic status, and we performed interviews at two weeks and at four months, so at the final endpoint for each of the uh, participants and uh, check the depression scale, the mental well-being scale and also self-efficiency of, of, um, of the mothers. Next one. So this is an overview on, on, the, on the study progress screen phase. This was before all of this implementation some exclusions were needed and then the intervention as I said before was with all the trainings of all staff in um, on a very frequent basis and uh, we of course as also at your site you will have some information available and we noticed that the information the midwives the nurses the doctors have in their um, in their platforms available were before very different so we really get rid of all this. We did, did discarded all the uh, former information leaflet and exchanged them and uh, by the new versions I just uh, showed, demonstrated to you. This was the intervention period and afterwards last summer the second um, period so the after intervention phase. Next slide please. These are the characteristics of the two groups from the pre-intervention and the post-intervention. Only single, only, um, only um, those really with a wish to, to, uh, to, to breastfeed. And you see their, um, their skin to skin contact, um, how fast after delivery, how the distribution of the sex is uh, the gestational age very similar so no significant differences between the pre-intervention and post-intervention group next slide please well so what did we find the primary endpoint we noted that more infants receive breast milk at four months in the post-intervention phase compared to the pre-intervention phase. So we were really successful increasing the rate of breastfeeding at four months, so far after discharge home, to 75% compared to 48 before this intervention. And I think this is really a good success. And we of course hope that this will last and I already know that we have to retrain everyone. So this is nothing you do once and then it's fine for the rest of your career or on, on the, uh, of the hospital. No, you have to retrain. The second, there are a couple of secondary endpoints and we really noted that despite we had before and after the, um, this um, training period, the same staff available with the same number of um, uh, lactation experts. The parents asked for more support 
because of course they were more aware of the importance of breastfeeding. Next slide. So this is a quite busy slide again, but we on top were interested what in our population of the moderate to late preterms are the predictors of breast milk feeding success at four months of age. These are the univariate data. And you see that cesarean section is not good. That mothers delivered by cesarean section have less success with breastfeeding until uh, four months. On the other hand, you see that those, but these are data you know also from other studies, achieving at least 500 mil after two weeks, they are on a high probability to have for four months enough milk available. And um, the breastfeeding self-confidence was two weeks and also at the, at the end of the trial was important. And we also know that mothers educated better um, have more um, ability to really uh, achieve a good outcome for breastfeeding. And this is also known in neonatology for, for other endpoints. So these are the univariate data. On the next slide, you will see from the multivariate regression analysis that they hold also when correcting for all the others. They are still uh, significant and it remains that cesarean section is somehow a negative predictor of breastfeeding success. This brings me to the next slide. And almost, it's not the last one, but the concluding slide, that long-term breast milk feeding success in late, moderate and late preterm depends on what we know it is. Uniform information for parents and staff. And I think this is key, that the parents know that the staff is having the same information and vice versa. And this is luckily available with the new milk app and probably you have other apps at your side available. Then training of all professions is important. So you cannot only train the nurses at the neonatal unit or the doctors, you also have to involve the midwives. Then we notice that it's important to focus on the early experience of self-confidence. So really to make sure to empower the them, especially the mothers, that they are successful in what they are doing, that they have all the information needed to be successful in um, pumping or breastfeeding, what stage ever they do have. Caesarean section, I mentioned before, remains a challenge. We do a lot. We do um, very early bonding after C-section. We do um, special care to, to improve breastfeeding, but somehow it remains challenging to achieve good numbers there. And in my personal um, understanding, I think it's important to reach parents before delivery as soon as possible during pregnancy or make it really reality that um, parents get uh, at an early stage the information how important breastfeeding is. Next slide, please. Well, here, when you are interested to get more information, I put together um, some information package from our European School of Neonatology. We do have free lecture series. We have a free of charge module on breastfeeding. And when you want, like podcasts and you want to, to learn more about neonatology, you are more than welcome to listen to uh, neonatology now. And with this slide and the next one, I would like to thank you very much for your attention and again for the opportunity to share with you this very fresh data, not published yet, but shedding a light on this, to some extent, neglected population of moderate and late preterms 
making the majority of all preterms, 80 to 90 percent, but really needing our special care, our special focus to make sure that they have a very good development. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Sven, for this wonderful presentation. Also, how an implementation plan is important to raise the awareness and that could lead to a success. Uh, and thank you also for sharing uh, with us the European Neonatal uh, School uh, training tools. Uh, we will have the questions and comments at the end of uh, the, this webinar. Uh, so uh, now it's thank you again. Now it's my pleasure uh, to introduce you um, our second uh, speaker. Uh, Professor Miguel Sanz Pipon is physician at the Neonatology Department of Hospital La Paz. Uh, and he is the professor of the Department of P Autonomous University of Madrid and coordinator of the Pediatric Nutrition course of the Nutrition degree. He is also coordinator of the Gastroenterology, Nutrition and Metabolism section of the European Society for Pediatric Research. Furthermore, he is member of the Nur uh, Nutrition Committee of ESPGAN uh, and president of the Nutrition Committee of the Spanish Society of Neonatology. Last but least, member of the Nutrition Committee of the Spanish Pediatric Association. He is the author of more than 100 publications in the journals with high impact factor and principal investigator of several projects. So, uh, very impressive. Uh, <laughs> Uh, CV and uh, he will speak about practical solutions to overcome barriers to increase human milk feeding in the neonatal unit. So floor is yours dear uh, Miguel. Well thank you very much for this very nice introduction and really I want to thank European Milk Bank Association and Medela for inviting me to this webinar. It is the second opportunity I have because I have joined the first webinar already. So it is my second opportunity to be with you and I am really honored to be here. And in a very important topic is increased human milk feeding in the neonatal unit. I am a neonatologist, so I work as a neonatologist every day. And I am interested in nutrition. And the best way to improve the outcomes of neonates, particularly those very preterm infants, is achieving adequate intakes of own mother's milk. So let's go together to this scenario and try to see how we can manage to improve our own results. So human milk feeding, especially mother's own milk, is recognized as the gold standard for newborns. So it's true that the decisions we make in the feeding of these infants may affect their feeding goals. The first speaker, Professor Svein Wellman, has given a very nice insight in an improvement in feeding of late preterm infants. And he has really shown very clearly that intake in the first 14 days of life influence enormously what happens at four months. So I think that with this example, we can always go through and see honestly how we are at risk that those infants, that those mothers, those, those infants that do not receive adequate counseling during the, in the first hospitalization have a trend to feed less human milk, has hospitalization progress. 
So we have to be very careful because what we do in the hospital, particularly in the first 14 days, and then in the first month will influence the results of our feeding outcomes. So I really call your attention as neonatologists, dietitians that work in these units to be very careful because honestly, mothers change during the hospital stay. So we have to be very careful and very aware to be on top of them, trying to support them because it's really difficult, but as we are going to see, it is possible. Next slide, please. So let's go into what happened when the baby received own mother's milk. So there is plenty of studies that shows that accumulative dose of more than 50% of own mother's milk showed a six-fold reduction in the risk of necrotization and trochoitis in if the babies receive more than 50% of own mother's milk in the first 14 days of life. Also, when the babies receive higher dose of own mother's milk in the first 28 days of life, there is a reduction in the odds of late onset sepsis. On the other side, if the, if the baby receive formula feeding during days one to 14, there is a threefold increase in the risk of necrotizing and trochoitis. So honestly, if we want to follow Professor Sven Wielman and perform a quality improvement, the first 28 days of life is a critical period. So honestly, my main message is that we should focus on measuring and benchmarking the dose and exposure period for human milk used in the, in the NICU. Next slide, please. So honestly, as it has been very nicely shown in the previous study, but it has been shown also in two different studies that I share with you here, there is a need to initiate expression early. So when we have a mother of a very preterm infant that low pump milk volume, less than 150 ml per day on day four, there is seven to 10 times greater risk of formula feeding at NICU discharge. So I think this is very important to keep on mind. So when we look after baby, four days of life, four days old, and the, may, and the mother is not able to produce or to deliver to the infant at least 150 ml of own mother's milk, this mother needs urgent support because we know that this low milk volume predicts what is going to happen in the future. So please keep this number, 150 ml per day at day four, is like a cutoff point that if this occurs, we should act urgently. Next slide, please. So, next. So honestly, that means not only to start early, but to do it frequently. So it is very important. How often should I pump to succeed? So I think this message, it should be clear. So we should pump, the mother should pump 20 minutes every two to three hours, at least eight times daily. So the mother that is even that can be with the baby or that has to go home and stay at home maybe during the night. So whatever, she must wake up at least once a night to pump. So it's important not to permit herself to have a night, a night uh, rest longer than five hours. I think this is really important 
So honestly, if we want to succeed, it's important to do it frequently. So to pump frequently, let's say eight times per day. I think that is very important. It is also very important to reassure the mother that in the beginning is difficult, that when you start immediately after birth, the breast is not prepared because she has had a preterm baby. So there has been no time enough during pregnancy to the mother, to the, to the breast to get prepared. So it's normal that at the beginning, it can be hard or there must be a few drops or even nothing. But the important thing here is not only the amount, but that we are preparing the breast for the future. We are programming the breast. And I think that's very important. Next slide, please. So let's go together to at this a uh, little bit difficult a slide, but I hope we still cannot hear you. Sorry, sorry about this. Yeah, we still now. do not hear it now. <laughs> do you think now it's working properly? Okay, I am very sorry. So Listen. I don't know where you have left, but we have shown here in in the in the left of your finger in the left graph, we have seen a, a, a an inverse relation between human milk volume and sodium concentration in human milk, and we have seen that the human milk a volume production was related with daily pumping frequency. I hope this was clear enough. I'm sorry about this. And in the right, in the right side of the slide, you can see that there is a mother with a daily pumping frequency that changes a lot. So zero, eight, six, decrease to four, up to eight decreased daily pumping frequency to five, five, four, four, even two. So there is a lot of variation in daily pumping frequency in this mother. And then you can see that also the volume of milk production change a lot with the yellow line. So you see when there is a decrease, when there is a decrease, in daily pumping frequency of four, there is a decrease, a very important decrease in milk volume. And also with two here, daily pumping frequency of two, there is an important decrease of milk volume low, lower than 200 milliliters. So, and if we look at the sodium concentration in red, we see that there is a decrease in sodium concentration related with the increase in milk volume production. But uh, sodium does not decrease importantly as milk volume is not produced or is not enough produced. So milk uh, sodium concentration is still high, even going up when there is a pumping frequency very low, and there is an important decrease in milk volume. So here, these examples show that mothers whose pumping decreased for one day immediately show leaky cellular junctions, risking the milk supply. So I think from these examples, sorry for the problems with the communication, I think from these examples, we can learn that continued intense lactation support is necessary because if this does not occur, we place the risk of losing milk volume production and sodium concentration is a well biomarker for this measurement. Next slide, please. So I think this slide that uh, is very representative of what is our goals. So here we have learned that there is a critical early window and that 
most of the mothers are able to supply around 500 milliliters in the first 14 days after birth. So they are going to be able to really supply the needs of the preterm infants. But what really happens when the infants leave our unit and go home is that the intake and supply of healthy term infant is much higher, as is shown in the slide, than the preterm infant. So the preterm infants, when they achieve home, they need to catch up and they need to receive higher intakes than those received in the first weeks after life. And it's important to prepare the mother and the breast to be able to overcome these needs. So I think that it's important not only to be able to supply the needs of the preterm infants, but be able to prepare the mother and the breast to supply for full term future needs of these preterm infants. So that will allow us to be able to maintain exclusive breast milk feeding even after the child and for long. So that's very important to have enough production to, as we have already mentioned, to prepare the breast and program the breast to the, what, are, what is going to be needed when the infant will leave our unit and be at home. Thank you. So next slide, please. So what we must know is that it is possible to achieve high intakes in preterm infants. Recently, it has been shown by, for example, Cecil Moltu from Norway in a cohort of very preterm infants receive more than 92% of own mother's milk. So honestly, it is possible to achieve high rates of breast milk feeding. So it's important to know that what we, what we will do in the first days of life will influence what occur at this charge. Next slide, please. So it's true that uh, honestly it's not easy for the mothers of preterm infants to be able to feed them with own mother's milk. So in that sense, human milk banks are very important because they are honestly a bridge that allows the mother to focus on programming the breast and be able to uh, be able our the neonatologists to feed the infants till the mother is working hard in getting own mother's milk. But at this church, there is a lot of variations in Spain and also all over Europe in how much infants receive at this church. So it goes from around 36% of infants discharged with uh, own mother's milk compared with other centers that that very low birth weight infants receive even nearly 80% as a mean of own mother's milk. In that sense, the Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative for Neonatal Wards is in an adaptation of the WHO 10 Steps to Successful Breastfeeding. And I think it's important that we uh, really consider to follow this initiative. And this initiative, uh, as has been already mentioned by Sven Wellman before, uh, it is very important to do antepartum education and also post delivery education. So it's very important to honestly be able to educate the mothers and the fathers uh, before and after delivery. And 
to monitor the education, to be able to know if these infants and these mothers have been already approached and what has been the approach like. I think that is very important. It is also very important to train mothers first in hand expression. So in the beginning, they will immediately after birth, they will be able to get a colostrum and stimulate themselves. And then when the infants required on artificial pumping to have mechanical pumping that allows to have enough volumes. I think this is very important and it has been already stressed by Sven, the importance of training professional staff, as she already mentioned, physician, nurses, and um, midwives. Next slide, please. So I think uh, what we do in Madrid uh, is honestly to be very aware of the amounts the babies receive in the first days of life and as early as possible to approach lactation consultants and to work on the mothers that we are looking that there are some difficulties in providing own mother's milk. But I would like to refer you to this retrospective study of around 500 infants in a referral neonatal intensive care unit. In this unit, uh, Rebecca Hovan and, and her group has changed practice to proactive versus reactive model, that's what we do in Madrid, associated with increase in proportion of infant fed mother's milk. So honestly, the idea will be that all the infants that are in our units are high risk due to mother-infant separation, pump dependency. So all the infants are approached, not as we do, it's in a reactive way, but in a proactive approach. And they have shown that the proportion of infants met mother's milk has increased a lot. So I think this is really important. And I think the nurse, nurses in our NICUs are really the drivers of the change because they have a lot of contact with the parents. The parents in our unit remain 24 hours. So that means that the nurse is with the parents like between eight to 10 hours per day. And I think they are really the ones that can help the mothers with this proactive lactation support. Next slide, please. So I think we have, uh, uh, we have learned from Nina Moody this uh, really Miguel, <laughs> apologies. What about now? You can hear yes. me? Okay, sorry, 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 sorry. I don't know. There must be a connection or something. Thank you, I'm sorry. So we have learned from Nina Moody the relevance of measure, measure, measure. So I would like to stress now the, 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 the what you can't measure, you can't improve. So let's focus on what we should measure in my point of view. Next slide, please. So I think it is very important to collect the proposed key lactation and infant feeding metrics, because this all these feeding metrics will help us to develop a standards of care that support mothers in their lactation journey and improved infant outcomes. So honestly, a first step in this quality improvement process is that is the limitations of data used so far. So normally, for example, 
in in our uh, neonatal net in Spain, we collect the data of percent of infants in neonatal care receiving own mother's milk. So, but that means whatever, even 1%, even 10 ml per kilogram per day, whatever. So I think if we are able to collect the, the metrics that will help us, it will allow us to improve the care of our infants and also to benchmark and improve the quality of the service provided. So we have to honestly develop an institutional culture that prioritizes the use of human milk as is an essential step. Next slide, please. So I think we should discriminate, and I think this is very important, between own mother's milk and donor human milk and of course formula. But we should discriminate between own mother's milk and donor human milk. And it is important to collect which is the timing uh, the mothers take to mothers to receive lactation support. And also, what, has the, what is the age of the infant that the mother received the, the earliest colostrum or the earliest own mother milk? So I think the, the quicker, the better, the earliest, the better. So I think we should focus a lot in how much time we spend in giving colostrum. It is three hours, six hours, 12 hours. How long it takes to the mother to achieve some own mother's milk and deliver to the infant? Next slide. So I think this, uh, this already 10 years old paper give us different informations that we can share and we can learn from them. So in this study, they include 291 very low birth weight infants. That is a very important figure. And interestingly enough, they do as we do in Spain. So the, the study end up that 98% of these infants receive some own mother's milk. So nearly all the infants receive some own mother's milk during hospital stay. But interestingly enough, when we look at this chart, only 24% of infants receive exclusive own mother's milk at this chart, while 61% of infants receive no own mother's milk at this chart. So this illustrates very well the message I want to bring to you. Some own mother's milk is not predictive of what is going to be the outcome of feeding a discharge. Because here we have a core with 98% of some own mother's milk, but 61% of these infants receive no own mother's milk at this chart. So it's not a good predictor. But also, even this not good predictor protects from against neck and leg and late onset sepsis. So honestly, uh, that's focus that any amount of own mother's milk is important for the clinical outcome of the infant, but we should focus on mls per kilogram per day and cumulative percentage as really good quality indicators of future success of feeding at this church. Next slide, please. So in, in Madrid and in Spain, we have designed a study that I hope I will be able to share with you the results in future webinars. And it is supported by the Spanish Neonatal Association. So what we want to study is the breast milk intake 
in the population of preterm infants less than 32 weeks gestation or less than 1,500 grams in a group of 11 large Spanish neonatal intensive care units. So we have three units that, three units that we will recruit in Madrid that are the three big uh, academic hospitals in Madrid, two units in Barcelona, two units in Zaragoza, one unit in the northwest of Spain, Santiago de Compostela, one unit in Valencia, and two units in Andalusia, one in Granada and one in Malaga. So we are really expecting to know what is really the occurrence of own mother's milk intake in our units. Next slide, please. So the inclusion criteria, as I mentioned, is gestational age less than 32 weeks and or birth weight less than 1,500 grams. And what I think it's really the strength of the study is we are going to collect weight of the infant and volume, real volume of intake of own mother's milk, donor human milk and formula in the days 3, 7, 14, 21, 28, 35, and 36 weeks postmenstrual age. So honestly, we are going to know very well what is the intake of these infants in milliliters per kilogram per day and in percentage in the first 28 of life. Of life. So we are going to be able, sure, to confirm the data from Svin Wellman that that's going to predict the intake at 35 days and at this charge. And also we are going to collect main morbidities like periventricular leukomalacia, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, necrotizing enterocolitis, retinopathy of prematurity and sepsis. So I think that is going to give a lot of information regarding the relevance of consuming own mother's milk. Next slide, please. So I could like also to stress the information already posed by Sven Wellman in the first talk. So I think we should try to support mothers anyhow. And this APP that see, uh, he has uh, used and he has presented, I think is a very good example that will help in education, will help in collection of data, and I think will help the mothers with the lactation support and the nurses and the doctors in honestly face this very important topic and will help them in honestly uh, pump frequently and from the very beginning. So at the end in success in breastfed their infants at home. Next slide, please. So this mobile technology is true that Sven has talked about this one. There is a Chinese one. So they have been several that has been developed even in Spain, there is a local one. So the, the important thing is that the mother should honestly be trained on collecting by APP or by paper collection, what is the amount of milk she is extracting, particularly in the first days after birth, because that will allow her to have an estimation and to really see the relevance of pumping frequently. So maybe there are some e-technologies that allow the mother to uh, put into the APP the amount of the volume of milk and uh, the lactation consultant will join or will go to her and says, what happens, there is a problem. I have seen that in the last two days, you have produced whatever, 200 milliliters or 250. So it's true that it can be placed in a direct communication between the, the staff and the mother, but also can be used in paper and can be shared with the nurse, with the doctor and with the lactation consultant. So help can be given to the mother. Next slide, please. Okay, so ending up with my conclusions of this talk, I beg your pardon for the problems with the communication. 
but let's go to the personal conclusions. I think I have made enough uh, strength in the limitations in using ever or never receive human milk during NICU hospitalization. So we should use important quality indicators of own mother's milk intake during the NICU stay. The average daily dose in mLs per kilogram per day or and cumulative percentage as percentage of cumulative enteral intake of own mother's milk feedings are sufficient to explain the reduced risk of multiple morbidities, late onset sepsis, necrotizing enterocolitis, neurodevelopment, and rehospitalization. So we are in the time of genetics, but I think really environment is important and nutrition is the main conduct of environment or is the easiest way of modify environment. So I think own mother's milk is really our option. These quality indicators that amount, that focus on the amount of own mother's milk in the NICU should be incorporated. Next slide, please. And we also need to target lactation maintenance in this population as we have nicely shown with this data regarding volume intake, pump pump frequency, and sodium concentration in human milk. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, dear uh, Miguel. Uh, so we had two very uh, beautiful. Uh, 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 speaks which are completing each other. Uh, so, Professor, uh, 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 how do I go? Uh, I would like to present a few slides to complementing more your speech, uh, Miguel, and then uh, we will go to a question and answers uh, session. Okay, and next please. So uh, I would like to present here uh, in a few slides uh, the um, uh, results uh, of a thesis, a research study um, uh, of uh, uh, Begum, uh, a pediatrics uh, specialty thesis. And we found that breast milk shows protection against necrotizing enterocolitis, BPD, and sepsis in a dose dependent fashion. Yeah, next slide. Uh, this is an observational retrospective study, not published in an international area, only published as a thesis, and includes the data of preterm infants with just gestational age below 34 weeks. So uh, here there is uh, uh, Professor Zweman talk about uh, late preterm infants and uh, Professor uh, Sans so spoke about more very uh, pre very preterm infants. He's, here we have the data of very preterm infants and moderate preterm infants. So uh, who were hospitalized for 28 days uh, um, in, during a five-year period. Aim, the aims uh, were to evaluate those dependent protective effects of mother's own milk uh, against multiple morbidities. Next slide, please. So what we found, I'm not showing the graphs or uh, um, tables, but I will summarize here. In our group of 180 preterm infants, when breast milk volume was at least 25% of the enteral intake, there was protection against necrotizing enterocolitis. And as the breast milk volume reached 50%, besides necrotizing enterocolitis, 
the incidences of BPD, severe BPD were lower, com lower compared to formula group. And when breast milk intake reached uh, at least uh, to 75 percent, then the protection has been extended also to late onset sepsis. Next slide, please. Next slide. Also, we uh, measure it in another way, uh, okay, um, the dose-dependent effect. It showed that every 10 milliliter increase in breast milk volume uh, protected, uh, uh, decreased the necrotizing enterocolitis incidence by 1.2%, both in the first 14 days and in the first 28 days and the most um, protective highest protective effect was in the first week uh, this is this applies also to the uh, to bronchopulmonary dysplasia the impact was lower uh, and late onset sepsis but we didn't see this effect for uh, retinopathy Okay, so uh, when uh, I say the last words, can we have the next? Next slide. Breast milk confers protection for preterm infants against necrotizing enterocolitis, BPD and swear BPD and late onset sepsis in a dose dependent way. Uh, and considering our findings in, um, in in line with the previous speakers, monitoring the breast milk intake and targeting mother's own milk, of course, our aim is to reach 100%, but the minimum to a 50% uh, seem to be reasonable. Yes, uh, we can close the slide uh, and uh, I would like to first summarize what I learned from the previous uh, two beautiful speeches uh, professor Sven um, uh, and also Miguel so uh, from the first um, first speech uh, we saw that how an implementation plan changes uh, the uh, breastfeeding rates also at long term, how awareness is important and how training is important. And uh, real, we saw relevance of uh, being born just six weeks before, uh, how it is important and in terms of neurocognitive uh, development, also uh, cardiovascular. Uh, um, impairments or um, outcomes and I like very much uh, Van's words the, uh, that he told that we have to bring the breast milk at the center, center of our uh, NICU care and uh, also I liked very much that he addressed the neglected population so late preterm infants and uh, it was very important uh, his focusing on long-term breastfeeding outcomes and also for um, Miguel's uh, beautiful speech showed us the importance of, of monitoring, measuring, measuring, and the key um, measurement indicators uh, for uh, breastfeeding and nutrition in our NICUs. Uh, and yes, I agree that human milk, especially mother's own milk, is the gold standard. In the study I showed uh, you, all was mother's own milk. And uh, uh, there are some threshold values he showed us, uh, very important. And therefore, we have to reach at least 150 milliliters. And uh, frequency is very important, at least eight times uh, and every two or uh, three hours. And also, uh, very important uh, for me also cumulative intake, interesting uh, and cumulative human milk intake. So I invite here now 
our two speakers uh, and uh, now I will check the box for uh, questions and answers. No, questions. <laughs> uh, while you are preparing your questions because I don't see them, I will uh, profit my um, position to ask um, one question to Zwan and another to Miguel. Uh, Zwan uh, and or both of uh, our speakers, do you have information also at the other European countries about uh, breastfeeding uh, rates for late preterm infants and uh, very preterm infants at this chart and at four months? Um, well, I thank you, Cedric. I try to answer it. I do not have the exact data, but I think it is similar to Germany. And when seeing what Miguel presented, I expect, or I think that for late preterms and early preterms, it's even worse. It's less good than what we or what I demonstrated on the German average population. Uh, Miguel, would you like to add something? Um, I think uh, I, there are different points that I would like to stress. The first one is that at this chart, uh, maybe the results in Spain are very good, or in Madrid, in our place, even uh, regarding uh, late Britain infants. But what we do not have the data, and I think is really striking, is at four months correct at, at four months corrected date. So I think that's really very powerful to see what is the long term effect of our uh, of our intervention. So I think in that sense the data from Sven is fantastic, and I would like to congratulate him. And honestly, we should learn. It's difficult, but I think we should learn in trying to collect. We are trying to collect in our uh, unit data, not in preterm infants, but in universal infants born in our maternity, what are the results at one month? That is less ambitious, but trying to see a little bit farther from, from this charge. But well, so honestly, I do not have data to comment. But regarding very preterm infants, there is, a, I already mentioned, Cecil Molto from Norway, published in Clinical Nutrition, a study in very pretty infants is an intervention study regarding uh, DHA and arachidonic acid. But uh, the important thing is that in the uh, is infants below 29 weeks and in the week four of life, 96% of infants receive exclusive own mother's milk. So I think uh, it's impressive data. So honestly, I think that it is possible to do a great work even with the uh, smallest infants below 29 weeks. So I think we should learn and we should work hard because we are really able to, to do a good job. So that's what I would like to share that it's, to succeed is possible. Yes, you both of you showed this that success is possible uh, with awareness. Uh, both, so thank you both for uh, the uh, presentations. We have a question: How important is your co-working with gynecologists in the maternity? This is how important. I have a related question too. Is uh, when you talked about. Uh, training. How important training the administrators of the hospitals also to understand what we need? Um, well, to, to answer first, how important this with the women doctors, gynecologists, I think this is very important. Well, with the midwife, they are close to the mothers and to, to, the, to the parents, but it depends on each single world. 
what a doctor or nurse or professional is t um, talking to the parents. And if there's a negative um, phrasing in the sum, it doesn't matter, or we do have different options, this is important. So I think, therefore, it's key to involve everyone and make sure that they phrase everything in a positive breastfeeding support and manner. So we have we have an, uh, an experience with colostrum. So it's true that we give colostrum to every baby immediately after birth, even a few drops, and we start very soon. I think the the mean is six hours, so we are starting very soon. Uh, and the sex seat of this program, well, is a neonatologist called Esperanza Escribano, who is the leader, and she has worked very hard on this. But uh, honestly. Uh, the collaboration with midwives, uh, gynecologists, uh, maternity board is very important because they have to help in uh, helping the mother uh, when she went to to the maternity and the baby comes to us, and then they have to bring uh, the colostrum to us. So I think it's all a process. So I think honestly, collaboration it is well, it's crucial. For example, for this colostrum, uh, unless it works together, if not, it's impossible that the neonatologist who is attending the very preterm infant, even taking central line or whatever, or looking after respiratory distress syndrome, and has to focus on colostrum. So I think it has to be in a, a collaborative work. So I think in that sense, it is really crucial. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And there is a question. Uh, what it means are you missing for supporting your work in the data? I didn't understand this question, so I cannot. Uh, probably it's asked. Uh, what, okay, what are hygiene requirements for milk sampling? Stephanie is, is asking. Milk sampling milk collection? I think uh, milk collection. What are the hygiene requirements? Yes, it's collection. Uh, Miguel? Miguel. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I, 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 I do not understand very well, very very well the the question, but yeah. I I I will try to help. So the idea uh, is: how, uh, What are the hygiene measures are you taking when you collect uh, yeah, the milk? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Wow, that's that's very yeah. Okay. So I mean, it's hand washing and to be careful. So I think that's the point. It's hand washing. So I would say. If we do hand washing correctly, but it's true that uh, we are a public hospital. We have a lot of deliveries. We have a big intensive care, and we are going to present in the next meeting in the ESPR. We are going to present some data. Uh, we don't hear you. We don't hear you. <laughs> What about now? It works? Yes. Sorry, sorry about it. It works. This. Okay, so we, what I was saying is uh, we have problems with colonization of own, of own mother's milk delivered to our milk bank because of, I think, IgM problems. So I think it's hand washing uh, and it should be a stress and it should be educated very well because we have found in some uh, time uh, periods, a uh, big colonization from gram negatives in own mother's milk. So I think the IgM measurements are very important. Yeah. Um, I, I got a question when listening to you, Miguel, um, because, well, we, we all know that it's so important to have um, the lactation increase in the first few days after delivery. And you mentioned the 150 ml was four days or half a liter was 14 days. And we know that the mothers, when they deliver a preterm, 
they often are sick. There's a certain reason for this prematurity. They have an infection, they go to labor, and um, but there is the group of those with preeclampsia with hypertensive disease. And in my experience, is this is a group most difficult to get this um, this number, this volume really um, raised that, to bring this group to successful lactation. Do we have a special um, idea or recommendation what to do with these mothers? Is there something different we should do? Higher frequency, longer pumping? Honestly, I do not have. I mean, you mentioned that I, I think it is important to realize that there is difficult and uh, what I would like to stress is this concept of really preparing the breast. So the, be, be, be like soft and positive and reassuring with the mothers that it is sometimes it, it takes the time, it is difficult, small amounts, whatever, but should proceed, continue that we have a window of opportunity and that we will be able to overcome. So I think this type of approach, but honestly, there are certain uh, situations that are difficult. So as you mentioned, around 30% of our mothers are really in a hard condition and sometimes it is difficult. So it's true, but honestly, in that sense, we have a very good, for example, colostrum we have nearly universal colostrum administration. So we uh, order colostrum as a drug. So, well, I mean, as a drug, I mean, as a medication. So it is in our, in our system, a pure colostrum during the first five days of life. And really we give it like 0 0.1 ml in each cheek, like uh, every six hours. And we achieved really universal uh, uh, in all the infants. So a small amounts are always possible. And I think it is very important to train the mothers to have manual extraction in the beginning. So the amounts uh, achieved in are very small, but they are very soon. And I think they prepare the breast. And I think later on, uh, we can be able to overcome this delay. So that is a little bit of our experience. Yeah. We have another question. Do, do you have data on the volume of milk you discard from the bank? Sven, you are the, the, you are the, the new human milk banker. Um, well, <laughs> we, some, some, of course, we do so far a testing, uh, microbiot um, microbiotic testing of all samples we collect, even though we uh, pasteurize the milk. And those with numbers of bacteria we discard. So therefore we do have right now, I would say 20% or something of all what we collect, we have to discard because the hy hygiene measures are probably not that well. But with a new guideline established in Germany and published a um, few weeks ago, um, it's not anymore really recommended to do this uh, intensive testing when you do pasteurization. So we will reduce it and then I'm quite sure that we have less um, discard. So were you uh, analyzing each batch or each sample? So each batch, each, each bottle with, with 60 to 100 mole the mother brings, we take a swap and send it to testing. So it's quite expensive, but we started on this. And now with the new guideline, it's the first guideline and clear guideline on, on human milk banking. We really are happy to see that we can reduce this uh, expensive, time consuming um, process. And you uh, test after the pasteurization, of course. No, afterwards no? not. No, no, we just test no. before what we give to, um, if we would use or not use it. But after pasteurization, uh, we believe that uh, it's fine. 
Okay, another uh, question to Professor Wellman. How you were, a were you able to convince your team to take this action? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, that's, that's a key question, I think, because everything you're going to implement needs uh, intrinsic motivation of the team, otherwise you fail. And um, I'm happy that the nurses were really interested to, to do this and it was really a broad experience with everyone to do this. So it depends and sometimes you have to wait a little bit and see what are the ways you can take. Um, well, and it requires that it's bottom up, not only top down, because top down can be successful, but can also fail. So uh, I think we are just on time to conclude this beautiful webinar. So I thank you, our speakers, uh, for their contribution. Very precious. Uh, both of them underlined the importance of uh, use of mother's own milk and how we can increase its use in NICU and also in the world for uh, late preterm infants. Uh, I would like to conclude uh, with an information uh, all, most of you know, but uh, there has been a, a European Commission conference uh, on 24th of June uh, in Brussels, the uh, European Commission uh, had prepared a proposal uh, uh, for the regulation on substances of human origin two years ago. Uh, and uh, for the first time, uh, donor first human milk for the first time uh, has been considered as a SOHO, like, like cells, like tissue, like blood. Uh, substance of human origin. Uh, but with ne in some negotiations and discussions with the um, related authorities in the European Commission, we were also, uh, um, as stakeholders, uh, were in, uh, in these discussions. Now, mother's own milk is not included uh, in this um, uh, regulation. Uh, but uh, so I uh, can we go to the next slide? Yeah, I uh, I was privileged to be in this uh, um, conference as a panelist, as a representative of EMBA. As you can see here, there are uh, EMBA is inside or within the SOHO associations, like plasma derivatives, like uh, retro reproductive medicine associations. So uh, there was a mod uh, moderated panel, and uh, of course uh, I uh, addressed that there are still some concerns because there will be adaptation in three years, and all human milk banks in Europe. Uh, until 2027 has to adopt uh, the new regulation. But of course, uh, yes, it is in one sense very good uh, that all the recipients and donors will have uh, safety and security at the European level, but also there are concerns that over-regulation uh, could cause uh, the closure of small banks or maybe would avoid also opening of the new banks. And also there are some concerns uh, regarding um, commercialization, uh, commercialization of the human milk. Uh, but uh, I would like to announce here too, uh, in, we have now an Imagine uh, European uh, Fund, European Union funded Imagine project, EMBA and his partners. So what is this Imagine project? It's the uh, implementation of harmonized um, guidelines, human milk guidelines throughout uh, Europe. 
So we will be drafting in a short time European milk banking guidelines. This will help, of course, because uh, European regulation is a frame more. So we need more details, uh, guidelines. And also EDQM, European Directorate for Quality of Medicine, is regularly updating a breast milk chapter in their technical guides. And EMBA experts are involved also in uh, updating this chapter. So what we will do that in this transi uh, uh, transition period, we will finish this uh, project and be close to our members and uh, try to cope with all these uh, difficulties. So uh, I close uh, this um, webinar here. Also, I publicized uh, the next one in this way because we will have another one in October 8th. Uh, and a moderator will be Professor Guido Mora. Uh, Prof. David Lambo will speak about uh, uh, viruses, virus transmission, and I will be speaking about the European regulation and challenges. So thank you to our speakers. I applaud them here. Uh, and thank you, Medela, and thank you all uh, our audience. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.